This episode is brought to you by BoardGameTables.com. If you're in the market for a beautiful, hand-built, custom board game table that is sure to become the centerpiece of your game room, go check them out over at BoardGameTables.com and mention Heavy Cardboard when you do. Heavy Cardboard, Episode 50, St. Petersburg. Coming to you from an anonymous location deep in the heart of Mother Russia, welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics in the board gaming hobby. We're your hosts, I'm Edward. I'm Amanda. I'm not a host, but I'm Tony. <laughs> I'm a guest host. So welcome back on a quarterly basis, Tony. Woo-hoo. Thanks, host everybody. Host Emeritus. Host Emeritus. <laughs> Thank you, Patreoners. Yeah. Yeah. So what you been up to, man? Well, I've, I've been enjoying my uh, retirement from Heavy Cardboard, but uh, <laughs> thrilled to be on once a quarter. That'll, that'll fit my lifestyle pretty darn good, I think. Cool. Okay. Heavy Cardboard community is awesome, so... Good to be talking at them again. I'm sure they're happy to hear from you. So we had the Modest Mouse brand new concert a couple weeks ago, and uh, it was all right. Um, yeah, a lot of songs that neither band played, and Modest Mouse cut their set short, like 20, 25 minutes. So it was very modest. It was very <laughs> modest, exactly. Yeah. And uh, But brand new, they brought up a ton of energy. It was fun, but it was definitely far from the best show that we've seen, oh, yeah. I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, it was all right. The end. It's live music, so. Eh. Right? Plus, at Red Rock, so that's a win. Yeah. yeah. So, Weight Watchers, go ahead and get this out of the way. Who has two thumbs and has dropped 40 pounds? This guy. Yay! Down to 214, so it's an even 40 pounds in six months now. Awesome. Mm, very nice. I went to the grocery store the other day, and the lady in the meat department saw me, and she did a double take, and she's like, my God, you've lost so much weight i had to make sure it was you and got to talking to her about it and now she's gonna start weight watchers so hey that was cool yeah oh yeah she'll give you money for that right yeah seriously i'm down to 183 so i'm not quite i'm about 22 ish no i guess 24 pounds down so not quite as fast as edward but that's okay i'm a turtle in many ways and this way as well. Slow and steady wins the race. So I'm, That's, not, hey, I'm not giving up at all. No. Yeah, I think you're doing an awesome yep. job. Keep at it. You're enjoying the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Just keep going. Keep going. Absolutely. And thankfully, Tony is not doing Weight Watchers because he would wither away into nothing. Yes. <laughs> I am watching my weight. I'm keeping it out in front where I can see it. <laughs> there you go, right? Perfect. Copious amounts of, of, of whiskey, bourbon, and beer. And Starbucks. And scotch and coffee. <laughs> exactly. Lots of coffee. So we're getting close to starting on uh, getting the basement finished. We're very excited about that. Mm-hmm. Still have no clue what we're going to do down nope. there, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> Interesting note, the guy who does the basements, and he's shown us tons of pictures, and we know this guy does amazing work, a uh, fellow Marine and just a really good general contractor. He says he never writes up plans. He says, we talk and kind of go with it. And they every basement he's ever done, I've seen pictures of, looks amazing. So Well, if there's something you don't like, you can go, that's not what I said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Show me in the plans what I said. Come on, where exactly. are they? Exactly. <laughs> right. So it should be fun. but uh, Looking forward to it. I'm, I'm excited for it to start, but I'm also ready for it to just be done. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be an unpleasant six weeks. Yeah. Here. Yeah. yeah. But um, having been through it, it's really cool when done. Yeah, it'll be worth it. It'll just be a pain. Yeah, in the butt. I love your basement, mm-hmm. Tony. It, so yeah, it was a pain, but yeah, it's really worth it. Yeah, cool. In more ways than one. So I had a poker session a couple weeks ago. Finally went up the hill to go play again. Went great. Put in twelve and a half hour session, which was really unexpected. I expected to go up there play for four or five hours. Twelve and a half hours later, I won almost six hundred bucks. So yeah, that was nice. Woo-hoo! Might try and make it up there every month or so, give or take, depending on recording and the videos mm-hmm. and everything else. So 
Speaking of the videos, we hit our Patreon milestone, right? Yes, we did. Big thank you to everybody who, what, there's 80 plus uh, folks out there that are uh, financially supporting the show. So thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And we've already bought a bunch of stuff. They got microphones and tripods and lights that are enormous and all kinds of stuff to, to get recording. And we're excited to get started. Yep. Planning on doing one video a month. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. And maybe there'll be more. Maybe it'll just be the one. We'll play it by ear and just find out what's doable, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, it's funny. We we stashed all the lights and everything into the spare bedroom just to get them out of the way and whatever. And every time we walk past it, Amanda and I, we'd look at each other and be like, is it me or does that look like a porn set? <laughs> they were pointed yes. right at the bed. It was so funny. <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was pretty funny. We've since put them up. Yeah, so which, yes. Which YouTube channel is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we've also given away our first bi-weekly giveaways to our Patreon supporters. So come join and support if you'd like a chance at, for, at more free loot. You uh, went rafting recently, right? Yeah, that was, uh, uh, shoot, almost a month ago now or so. But yeah, that was uh, me, Matt, Ash, local yeah. gamer buddies of ours. We had a blast. It was absolute great time. Well, I wanted to tell you that. I hosted game day that day, and you went rafting, and Amanda was just too damn lazy to come over and play games. Exactly. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I had invited my 16-year-old nephew over for his first game day. And? How'd it go? Well, it went pr really pretty cool. He had, uh, my, my parents, his grandparents, had bought him Puerto Rico and some other games um, down in Little Rock, Arkansas, when uh, Jake was visiting them. And uh, but he's only ever played games like the Sheriff of Nottingham and, and crap like that. And so um, he's a really bright kid, though, and uh, we thought he'd do well. So he came over here and Paul, Chad and Tony and me and a couple others. We we started off with Ticket to Ride and he really didn't know what to do. man. With Ticket to Ride, he was like all over the place. Robin was freaking out. She's like, whoa, <laughs> uh, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. So he finished like, you know, eighth. And, um, <laughs> right, in a, in a five player right. game, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was thinking, well, geez, I don't know how this is going to go. Let's try Stone Age. Um, but everybody else around the table said, no, let's play Puerto Rico since he has a copy of Puerto Rico. So we played Puerto Rico. That makes sense. I, I was like, oh, okay, sure. And he did so much. He finished third out of a, t uh, there were four other players. A five player game, he finished third. So he played with four sharks and, pl and finished wow. third. Which is pretty hard to do in with experienced players in yeah, Puerto Rico. That's so great. I don't know. Maybe he just doesn't like the uh, ticket to ride crap, and he likes the heavier fare already, or something. You know. Nice. I hope it's that, and it, he's not anti train game. Oh so. no, because we played Transamerica. Okay, good. And he liked that, and we played Finca too. You know, that was cool. Ba cool. Banker Dave is always a fan for Finca, so. But yeah, so that went really, really well. So I'm hoping to get him back out uh, your house or my house for another game day here pretty soon absolutely. and keep him keep him growing you know absolutely cultivate those heavy gamers yeah. right? always need more oh yeah this is david cummings from the no sleep podcast we tell horror stories that keep you up at night so you can play more heavy board games you're listening to heavy cardboard All those folks who don't know how to get in contact with us, Amanda. Our website is heavycardboard.com. Our email address is contact at heavycardboard.com. We love hearing from you guys, so please don't be shy. Our Twitter handle is at heavycardboard. Our Facebook page is heavycardboard. Our YouTube channel is heavycardboardvids, V-I-D-S. Our Instagram is heavycardboard. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash heavycardboard. And our BGG guild number is 2044. So we had a few iTunes reviews uh, across the globe. So a big thank you to Drakentanzer, A.K. Vickenhagen, and Demaster2011. I'm sure I butchered these. One of these is over in Skanderhuvia in Sweden. But thank you very much to everybody. We really appreciate the iTunes reviews. And please, if you guys have not left one, 
think about doing so. It greatly helps the visibility of the show. Speaking of giving thanks, want to continue to say thanks to our Patreon supporters. So big thanks goes out to PC, Chad Cook, Kent Dorsey, Brian, Jeremy Carmichael, Calvin Baker, Pat, and Zach Landine. Thanks a lot, y'all. So, uh, Ebone, does Heavy Cardboard still do contests now that I'm gone? <laughs> oh, yeah, quite a few, thank you. Since you uh, you you sent that parting shot, hey, you should do one every episode. <laughs> so we're doing one just about every... I think we are doing one every other episode, so thanks for that. <laughs> but no, no, it's our way of giving back to folks for listening, so I, we're happy to do so. So as a reminder that you can still enter our giveaway... For a new and shrink copy of Euro Crisis, go to heavycardboard.com forward slash Euro contest for the details. We will stop accepting entries on July 15th and we'll announce the lucky winner next episode, episode 51. We'll ship free here in the U.S. We'll help with international uh, shipping with the first 15 covered by us. Again, thanks to German Mike for donating the game for us to give away. Good luck, y'all. So, Acquired. Wow, it's not just me. This is awesome. I'm so excited about this. Wait, since the last time I was on? Or or yeah, just recently? Hey, well, whatever. Get coming, no, folks. No, just recently. So you first. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, 1812. It's a two to four player, two to four hour train game. And that's not entirely untrue. Because at HeavyCon, I played a three, eight, a three player game in three hours. So that was pretty groovy. Nice. Nice. It's a tiny 1861. Really cool game. The 2016 Winsomes rolled in at my house, and I did they roll in at yours? They did. We actually got them on Thursday, but we haven't opened them yet because I was kind of wanting to do an unboxing to show people on Periscope, so cool. we're probably going to do that later on this week. Got, got a copy of Yokohama from Japan a, fun, a bunch of weeks ago. We'll be talking about Yokohama later. Two years later, the Tokaido Collector's Edition with the painted miniatures arrived. And, wow. uh, and what do you think about it? Those minis are, are really, it's, it was worth the wait. They're really nice, nice looking. It's, it's fun to play with minis. And you're a former painter, so I would think that you would know what you're talking about on that. Well, they're not like painted to any, not to my standard, but like for a mass production thing, really, really nice. Okay. And uh, cool. they, they have a Tokaido app coming out around Essen for iPad. And dude, it looks amazingly gorgeous and beautiful a video game based on a board game instead of the other way around i i do hope that it's not done by game salute yeah. and here's why i say that just today we read that apparently there was a kickstarter that game salute did back in 2012 or something like that for an app for alien frontiers they decided they didn't want to renew their hundred dollar uh, iTunes license or whatever, so now it's unavailable. So all those the sixteen thousand dollars that they generated, they couldn't justify a hundred dollars for an annual thing wow. to keep it available to people. It's a nice corporate bonus to keep. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> so gross. Anyway, uh, the, continue. The last Sorry. thing was Die Bergen von Bergen das Kartenspiel. So, That'll make Chad really happy. That's why I said it like that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because every time we call it Castles of Burgundy, he's like, I, I'm unfamiliar <laughs> with that game. I, I got on um, a friendly local online game store, and um, they had it up for $10.13 or something. And you're talking the card game, Castles yeah, of Burgundy, yeah. the card game. And so game. I was like, eh, right. for 10 bucks, I, I got to try it. So I bought it. Have you tried it yet? I have. Okay, we'll talk about it here in a minute, I'm sure. Indeed. What have you acquired, Mr. Edward? Well, the, the three 2016 Winsome subscriptions, like you mentioned. So I figure I'd mention them at least real quick. Sure. 1859, which is you know basically 1830, or is based on 1830, set in South Africa. Supposed to be a tough game, though. So that's cool. Here's what uh, I was emailing with Borer, and he said, uh, it's not as tough as 57, but the fact that tokens don't block really is not as big of a boon as it seems, and it causes some challenges. So I'm really looking forward Interesting. to that. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Cool. And then there was Chicago and Northwestern. My fa If you know nothing about the game, in the description, not a friendly game. <laughs> it's, Sign me up. It's okay. not. <laughs> it's cool. You've played. Oh, you're going to hit on these. That's right. And then German Rails, not to be confused with German Railways, which is a real implementation of Gulf Mobile. 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 
and Ohio. But we'll talk about those more here in a minute. Not to be confused with German Mike either. Right. <laughs> correct. So two last things. Uh, Scythe arrived. Compliments of Jamie Stegmeier. So look for a review of that in the next few episodes. That just arrived yesterday, yesterday. in fact. Mm-hmm. And uh, we actually we spent some time just walking around Barnes & Noble the other day looking at books and stuff. And Amanda was like, hey... Why don't we go check out the Red Dot sale, see if they have anything. So we bought a puzzle, a puzzle like old school, like 1,000-piece, 1,500-piece puzzle. Looks really cool, whatever. But we wanted to try it, so we did. So they had two core sets of the Game of Thrones card game, the second edition. I'm curious to give it a try. Yeah, yeah. I love card games and um, anything Game of Thrones I am going to be in love with. So I'm really excited to try it. I saw that somebody said that... It had completely um, overthrown Dominion as their favorite two-player game with their spouse. So I know how much you love Dominion. So Not I'm hoping, so <laughs> I'm hoping that this is a card game that you and I can play together that isn't San Juan because that's really the only card game we play together. Cool. I will remain silent so as not to offend my friends. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to hunting, anticipating, shopping list, etc. Let me get mine out of the way real quick because I know you have Rocket. like the entire uh, inventory huh? of multiple online game stores wanting to acquire. So <laughs> no. for me, the only thing that I'm currently hunting that I really want a copy of after hearing you guys talk about it was 1822. So that's that's my biggie that I'm really jonesing to get. And I know how to sticker it, so we're already halfway there. <laughs> cool. You'll have another one to sticker soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and why is that, Tony? Uh, well, because, uh, yeah, it's uh, about to be on its way here. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, uh, I haven't ordered it yet, but that's why I sold Key Market, so I can buy that. I'm just trying to figure out the other game to buy, too. I'm thinking... Uh, it's going to be 1822 and either 37 or 58, so I'll have to, I'll have to make that decision up. Um, there is one thing all of us are anticipating that um, we just found out about on Twitter today. I don't know if you guys have been have seen that, but uh, Jason Dinger is oh dude is making us like custom dice trays, velvet lined, made out of cypress. So, you know, so excited. He's a Louisiana boy. I'm a Louisiana boy. Cypress, man, that's gonna smell like home. That's gonna be yeah. Awesome. That, uh, I'm really excited about that. Mm-hmm. He he sent me a, a DM. Um, I don't know. A couple of weeks ago, I want to say I've been I've been out of the loop the last couple of weeks, honestly. But uh, he was like, "Hey, I'd really like to do this for you guys," and I was like, "Wow, um, you don't have to, but thank you." And he's he enjoys woodworking, yeah. so I was like, "Yeah, hell yeah, that's awesome! I'm excited about that." That's so awesome. Eighteen forty four slash eighteen fifty four is. Made its way here, apparently. Uh, Velma has some, or at least she did uh, a day or two ago. Uh, Excuse me, I'll be right back. Go ahead and cover me. (laughs) (laughs) I I love you, Velma, um, but I'm not going to buy one from you. I'm sorry. Just um, the local game store... I'm going to get one from them because they let us play train games there every every Saturday, but I don't go every Saturday. It's out of stock. Okay. (laughs) Whoa. Cool. Uh, El Grande. I, I feel like I want to get a copy of El Grande because I enjoyed it so much and it was an area control game and I'm really kind of freaked out about that. What? Interesting. And, and like, have either of you played this? Yes. Yes. Yes? With yes. your daughter, okay. actually. Really? Yeah, we played this with Jess, remember? I don't I remember. Do. Yeah, I don't remember I do. who the fourth was, but yeah, we played it with Jess a long time ago. We were both kind of lukewarm on it, but yeah. honestly, I think that I think that I would be more. I, 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 it's a game I want to revisit. I mm-hmm. guess is what yeah. I'm trying to say. We no longer have it, but um, yeah, I'd be willing to give it a, another try for sure. Automania. I mean, I need to. I think I need to check this out. I watched uh, Jay play, do a walkthrough of it, and. Um, it looks totally ridiculous artwork, but it seems like there's kind of a cool little production game there. So I want, right. I want to try that. Nobleman, I got a five-player play of Nobleman in, but I, I think Robin's going to like that because of the spatial stuff. So nice. I got question marks by that one. I, I It might be almost hunting. I don't know. We'll have to see. It's only like <laughs> 20 <laughs> bucks. It's, it's really cheap might on be. Amazon. You know, so. 
and uh, awaiting my Medici Kickstarter, which should arrive hopefully within days. If you're looking forward to that, I can pass off my early edition one to the one with the ugly art. Well, they're all they all but all but the French version are ugly. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> so anybody out there who wants a, an ugly second edition of Medici, drop me a note. It's yours. <laughs> Just pay the freight. All right. So now, since your departure from the show, we started up a, a little tiny little segment here, the looking forward to playing. So Amanda, you want to you wanna start that one? Honestly, games in general. That's what I'm looking forward to playing. Um, we <laughs> haven't Actually, been you know, recently... That's... That that's been a fair point. Yeah. You and I haven't had a chance to play a whole lot no. due to personal reasons as well as just life getting in the way, whatever. Yeah. Um, as you're going to hear here soon about the what have we been playing? So I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. Just literally just playing games with my husband and with our friends sounds like just heaven to me. So that sounds awesome and i'm very excited to just play games <laughs> seriously I, I really can't argue with that i did highlight a couple of specifics but i i would i echo your sentiment mm-hmm. there yeah more millennium blades and i do yes. want to try that two player yes uh i want to try i don't know if i'm going to like it but i want to try star wars rebellion uh, Panthalos, Princes of the Renaissance, and more Crisis as well. Yeah. C- Crisis was cool. Tony, how about you? Anything you're excited to play specifically? Specifically, well, say two things. One okay. one is just more 1822 because it's really cool. Talk about that in the, in the playings. Two is 1865. So um, you guys aren't coming over tomorrow to play a train game with Chad and I. And so... The way to, uh, I don't know, help us get over that that sadness <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is uh, we're gonna we're, Robin's gonna play 1865 with us because uh, she that's awesome she's pl- she's played it before and she wants to play um, a train game with more than me and awesome. uh, with with quote unquote safe people yes. i.e. familiar so like you right? Amanda Chad okay <laughs> so she's All right. she's getting awesome. she's getting braver so uh, she won't get to play with. All, all four of us. You'll just get to play with me and Chad, I guess. But uh, so let's keep that in mind as we go forward. And uh, apparently, I want to play some more El Grande, and especially since you guys were lukewarm and got rid of it. Um, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was. I, I think like you know the four of us and Robin. Because Robin sat there watching, and she was like, "Oh, I, I think I'd like this." <laughs> so, so the and Chad says it's a five player game. Period. Play something yeah. else. So, um, right. And I could see that easily, but uh, so the five of us should, oh, should bang that out. Control. Yep. Hey, sign me up. Absolutely. So, uh, you guys, what have you been playing? I guess. Uh, well, we've been playing not very much. We've been playing um, <laughs> the game of well, life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Spin the um, wheel. <laughs> and you, and, and I was gonna say, and you thought that was a bad version. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> um. We played Crisis. We were sent a copy to. Um, we were sent a copy by the publisher Luda Creations to play and and talk about a little bit on the show. Um, it is. I use qu- prototype as loosely as possible because this is literally the nicest prototype I've ever seen. Totally agree. It it just hit Kickstarter. What two days ago? A well, days I guess ago, this yeah. is releasing on Monday, so we'll call it like three four days ago, whatever. Right. Um, but the version we got. Uh, I wouldn't have been upset if this was the edition I got for backing the Kickstarter. No. It would, I, I was I was hella impressed yes, with that. It is it had punch boards and I mean everything. It was the 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 uh box is amazing. Just the whole thing is just great. And um but but yeah, so let's talk about it just a little bit here, just in the heaven playing area. Um the board is quite busy, but there's there's reasons for everything on it. It's a little too dark for my taste, but you know the art's great. As long as you like futuristic art, you're good to go. Um, the flow of the board the fifth is easy. Element. Yes, fifth element for sure. Um, the flow of the board is easy to understand once you look at it and understand what you're doing. Um, it's you know this is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Um, 
I thought that it kind of had like a almost a royal goods feel to how the buildings work. You feed in a resource and then it spits out as payment another resource. And, and then you can use those resources to then do fire other stuff. Other yep. other companies. Exactly. Yep. And then or you can hire workers to boost productivity as well. It's just I enjoyed that part of it. We played the easiest level. There are many difficult different difficulty levels to the game. We played the easy level, and it Which showed was a mistake. it was a mistake. This yeah. would be much more enjoyable and make me want to play it more if there was a little bit more competition because you're not only competing against each other, but you're also competing against the game. And making sure that you keep your head above water right. as a group because it kind of reminded me a bit of CO2 in that if everybody doesn't cooperate in some sense... You know, the world's going to be completely... Mm-hmm. It's uh, just going to collapse and bend. Right. And and everybody loses right. at that point. Right. And so this had that kind of feel to it. But at the same time, you're still trying to beat each other's brains in while competing against one another. Right. You have to kind of play together, but obviously against each other to try to win. And I enjoyed that portion of it. And I will like it more playing at a di- more difficult level than the basically, you know, like the base level. Agreed. Um, yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. It was just, it was too, the, the pressure there of was, the game wasn't there. Was there was no pressure whatsoever. Right. Yeah. Right. Looking forward to playing it more. Hopefully uh, be able to talk about it again before the Kickstarter ends a little bit more in depth and have more plays under our belt. So I'm really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. it you know, it's probably on the medium side of things, uh, but that's going to be determined by the difficulty of the level that the right. players want it to be. Um, so I'm excited for it. Mm-hmm. I'm genuinely excited for yeah, it. Same here. Cool. And then we also played Yokohama, which we will talk about later, and St. Petersburg, that we will obviously talk about later. Yep, Amanda covered it. Tony. Okay. Uh, I won't say Yokohama or St. Petersburg. Ah, <laughs> um, 18MS, English Chris, you know. Was over, yeah. and uh, Skippin and uh, Ash, Ash were over, and we were looking for a war game to play. And Chris, the war gamer, said, I've never played an XX game, and Skippin jumped all over it and said, Of course he 18 did. 18MS. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we played that. That was pretty cool. Been playing uh, a couple games of Taikaido with the miniatures, and that's really cool. I would prefer that with some sake, but whatever. <laughs> just just played a six-player round of Medici, not the new one, but, you know, the crappy one. But it's still Medici. Oh, man. Just like with six players that know what the hell they're doing, that is just a brutal auction. I love it. I love it. I love it. Garbage Day. I played some Garbage Day. I don't know if you guys saw my tweets. No. So, uh, Kleiker. Yeah. Don't bring this around anymore. Um, it's, a, it's a take that player elimination dexterity card game. And is it the one where it's uh, uh, bal- balancing cards on the edge of a garbage pail yeah. or whatever? And this is the worst piece of <laughs> that I've ever played in my life. <laughs> it should be called Absolute Garbage. Burn it with fire. If This game's a zero. It's not even a one. It's a zero. Wow. Goodness. Um, it's not all that There's bad. An endorsement. It, it says 30 minutes on the box. Well, after 45, there were still four of us in the game. We said, F- this. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> it's just like, this is amazing. Welcome back, T. <laughs> I was tweeting like crazy because it was really killing me because it's um, just random hell. The actual stacking of the cards is pretty cool on the trash can, you know. I'm so going to have to go back on Twitter and look at this. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh, you know, we've all been talking about 1822, and that's a seriously good game. Uh, a lot of auctions in it. You know, the one thing... Like Paul Chad always says, you know, God, I wish it was an 18xx game that had more auctions in it. Well, this one does, or, or that has auctions throughout the it, game, and it does, yeah. just on the front end. Yeah, it's uh, you know up until about halfway through the game, there's stuff to be auctioned. Now that does add a time element to the play, um, but it's it's totally cool, totally worth it. But if you're enjoying the auctions, who cares? Absolutely, right? you know, absolutely. Exactly. And there are some variants to speed it up on the auctions. Played Scoville with the Labs expansion, and uh, as you, I, I don't know if you guys know, Robin loves Scoville, and um, that Labs expansion is pretty cool. It speeds up the game a little bit. You can get to the the better peppers sooner, so that's a good good thing. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
But does does your uh, customized uh, little markers do those still apply with the expansion? Yeah, yeah, they do. You don't have right. to use them on the lab just because it's kind of the lab or the lab is very simple. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, man, I, I got a play of Nobleman with five. That was the first time I ever played it. I thought it was fabulous with five. I I don't think it's got legs. You know, the game's history on BGG would seem to indicate that, but that spatial element and the way the queen mechanic makes the game length variable. I, I just thought it was really cool. Uh, the Kessel's Burgundy card game, sorry, Chad, uh, really, really solidly mediocre. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest, I when I saw it, because I know Amanda's mm-hmm. you know favorite game is Kessel's Burgundy, right? So I was like, ah, and I was like, no, yeah. I'm just, I'm so tired yeah. Of the oh, dice yeah. game, it, the card game. It, just it, I had no interest in this game whatsoever. It's a game on a poly games. It's a card game. It's not Castles of Burgundy. It's got a couple of. It's got the art and maybe one or two um, similar mechanics in it. But it's a totally different game. The worst thing the publisher ever could have done was say, "Oh, it's Castles of Burgundy, the card game." Yeah, just make it something different. Make maybe. it exactly, girl. Make yeah. it just something else. But um, yeah. nevertheless, it's still mediocre and. In my opinion, further evidence of the decline of Steffenfeld. Oh. Did he design that? He did? It's got his name on it. Okay. Gotcha. Fair enough. So, um, yeah, that's going to be uh, in an upcoming auction. Chicago and Northwestern, one of the new Winsomes. Uh, it's not a stellar game, but it's really, really cool, and I like it a lot. German, okay. German Rails, uh, hated it. It's on the marketplace right now, hoping someone buys it. It's uh, VP instead of money is the end game goal. There's, there's. I felt no tension in the bidding, um, and just it, around building track in the roar. It's just there's no decisions to be made there. It's um, not, not my, mm. not my kind of game. Borer told me I'm the still game was solid. To try it. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure, still, sure. Yeah. Borer, Borer told me the game was solid. And, and after several plays, that would come out. But there's just nothing there that I want to play several times. I don't want victory points as the, you know, and I, I want tense auctions. And those were, mm-hmm. frankly, lame. Okay. Fair enough. SNCF 1830, it's a map I've been working on. I think I got it size-wise where I want it. So it's pretty cool. It's got a 2D stock market. That was fun. Yeah, that's a fun game. Played Caverna with five, which is three too many. And... Uh, <laughs> Or, or if, if in the opinion of some, five too many. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you can't always be correct. It's a fun game. It's a fun game. Hey, and it has a really cool insert too, right? Yes, Meeple Real Dude. Uh huh. El Grande. Whoa. I mean, the decisions are I thought were just absolutely delicious. The balance in the cards that you select each round. You got a full deck of cards, right? There's no random like, oh, I only get to choose from these. No, you can pick any card you haven't used already. And the balance between the strength of the card and the number of meeples you can pull out versus where does that, and that's really like an auction. Where does that put you for getting the action cards? And then the balance of the action cards where the really good ones only allow you to put out fewer meeples. It it was a solid game, man. Loved it. A lot of tension. A known good Euro. It's a known good area control Euro. Wow. Right. Santiago, which is another oldie, and uh, you're like making canals and planting plantations. That's It's a train game. Don't let the canal theme fool you. It's a train game. And uh, awesome. Really, really fun auctions. It goes really quick. Uh, very brutal. You get $3 every turn. Yeah, tight. <laughs> mm. So it, the incentive of that is to um, accept the proposals of other players so that you can collect some more money. So it, it, it's pretty interesting. Container, Matt, Viking Matt, has always been wanting to learn that. And uh, he and Banker Dave were staying late the other day. And so Matt said, Let, let's play Container. And we all said, yes. <laughs> Three's, for, for, three, for as big a game as it is, it plays amazingly fast. Oh, yeah. And three is just a good count for teaching. You know, I, I, like, mm-hmm. I, I like it with five, right? But So uh, Dave was kind of lukewarm on it, but uh, Matt loved it. Can't wait to play again. Good. And then... Obviously, Matt has excellent taste. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trajan is uh, always excellent, and uh, we got a great four-player of that in, and I won't bother telling you who won because you probably already know. Yeah. Yeah. If if Robin did was you one take of the second? Four, That's the yeah. only question. Dude, I, how, took, I took fourth, man. How far 
did she beat everybody? Uh, she beat the question. It was me, Banker Dave, Matt, and her, and uh, yeah, she had a good distance on Banker Dave, but it yeah, wasn't. I was about to say wasn't was too just, bad. I was literally just about to say, okay, so it was Robin, then Banker Dave, so you were four, so that yeah, me and Matt were like two points yeah. apart, <laughs> so if, we were both. If those fourth two and are playing, if those two are playing a game, it's Robin, Banker Dave. Yeah. 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 This episode of Heavy Cardboard is brought to you with support from Meeple Realty. We recently put together the Arkwright insert and it is absolutely fantastic. It makes setup and teardown so much easier and everything fits perfectly into the box. No half open box here. All of their inserts are very well made and add to gameplay of each game. Whether it's individual dice towers for Castles of Burgundy or literally the only way possible to store Caverna without the box exploding, Meeple Realty is plainly awesome. Check them out at MeepleRealty.com today. And when you buy one of their great inserts, tell them Heavy Cardboard sent you in the notes area at checkout. John Henry was a steel driving man. Yes, yes he was. Steel Driver, designed 2008 by Martin Wallace, published by Tree Frog Games. Plays three to six players and plays in about an hour, give or take a little bit. It's a relatively simple train game set in North America involving shares and building railway lines. The game plays quickly over five turns. Each player uses their investment cubes to bid for control of each of the six companies. When you take control of a company, you receive one share, which means that only one share per turn per company can be purchased. The cubes you bid with go into the company and allow it to build track. Each location has a value which determines how much profit you receive for connecting to it. After companies have built as much track as they can, Players are paid the profit that each company they control has made this turn. Profit levels are reset the following turn and every subsequent turn. Players get another set of cubes to bid with and then bid again for the control of companies. Cash earned from shares is essentially victory points as it can't be used to bid on future shares. As each player receives the same number of investment cubes each turn, there's little to no impact of owning the best shares until the end of the game. At the end of the fifth round, players who are the majority shareholders of each company will be in charge of selecting goods cubes from the board trying to get a large set of different colored cubes. The catch is that companies can only select cubes from cities from which the company has a connection. The larger the set, the larger the share value which is then paid out to all shareholders. Players add up the money they earn during the operating rounds, along with money they earn from the share payouts, and whoever has the most money wins. So Steel Driver. I mean, it's a simple game to to learn and to play, and it's kind of similar in Tinner's Trail in that respect. Connection scarcity drives the route building and racing for certain cities. It's possible to box in companies, so track lane can both be exciting as well as predatory. Winning auctions for cheap amounts isn't always the best idea because whatever you're bidding with those cubes, that's the track lane ability for that company. So if you win a company or if you win a share for three cubes, might not be laying a whole lot of track. Yes. You have to make sure that you are bidding just enough, but not too much. You have to have a plan whenever you decide what company you you want to uh, bid on. There's shared incentives, which make for interesting decisions for the simple fact that Tony and I might have this both be invested, but I have two shares to his one. So, yeah, I'm helping him, but I'm helping myself more. It's a game that heavy game fans and more casual gamers can enjoy for different reasons. There's plenty of meaty decisions, you know, for a relatively short game, but it's an easy entry point for lighter games. Could be... A good jumping off point, starting here, going into something like Chicago Express, etc. Playtime's pretty static, regardless of the player count. It has a, well, honestly, it's got a really good rule book, which is really hard to say for Martin Wallace. And fast setup, and it's quick and easy to teach. Uh, It's very simple gameplay until you get to the end of it. Um... And it's, it's Martin Wallace, so everything's very simple with the board and the bits and everything, which can be good and bad. You know, I don't care. It's Martin Minimalistic, Wallace. Minimalistic, almost. Yeah, and that you come to expect that from his games. Although, 
it's funny, here we are talking about winsome earlier in the episode. Okay, that would be the epitome of minimalistic, but <laughs> you know what I mean. I have only played Steel Driver one time, and it was with you two and I think Chad. Uh, and Robin. Taught... Oh, yeah, okay. And you taught the game, and uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I actually acquired a copy, and I am bummed out that I haven't played it again, frankly. Um, I just can't I can't remember enough about it to, to give any cogent um, thoughts on it other than I, I thought it was fairly simple. It's, uh, it's got trains and cubes, so that's a great, great thing. Um, the end game scoring is a little um, off from the rest of the game, it seems, but mm-hmm. um, whatever. I, I thought it was fine. Uh, other than off, though. Off, but fine. I don't know if that makes any sense. But. No, and, and rolling into the what's not cool, Some um, I, I, that's kind of my, my big thing here is yeah. there's a disconnect. Mm-hmm. It's like two Bet- different games. It really, it really kind of is. Be- between the majority of the game, which you're route building and, you know, getting dividend payouts and all that stuff and, you know, the auctions and all that. And then you go into that end game where it's basically a set collection game, but you can you're just literally picking up cubes from different cities that your companies have connections in. And it just the thing that you need to in the thing that you need to keep in mind as well as the hard part for beginners to comprehend is the whole game is building up to this point. It's all about this set collection and it's all about making enough connections to the right cities, not just the highest value cities, but as far as what goods those cities produce. And while it's very clever and very interesting, it feels disconnected and it's really hard to for beginners to be like, oh, okay, because of that disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I saw one commenter say that non-gamers really like that big reveal at the end of the game, but gamers don't like that. I thought Good that was call. an interesting point, and I feel the same way. <laughs> I fully agree with that statement. I only want one set to collect in a train game. Money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Chips. Chips. Chips, please. Chips of different colors. Uh-huh. Preferably so the other black. thing here I wanted to mention is four to five players seems to be the sweet spot in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, with less, you know, with three players, you're they're, there's just too little interaction, mm-hmm. but with six, it can be a bit too chaotic for any sort of real long-term planning. I'll be honest, if I had my druthers between Steel Driver or a similar length game in Tinner's, Tri- Tinner's Trail, I'm more likely to want to play Tinner's Trail than I am Steel Driver, but there's still enough here to be interested in and to want to investigate. So I don't know about y'all, I've played the game, I want to say, three or four times now, and I'm comfortable with giving it a rating of a four. There's definitely enough here that is interesting to me, but that disconnect, um, maybe with playing it more, I will either grow to like it more or dislike it more, That the difference between the meat of the game and that set collection at the end. But I think it's fine at a four for me. It's very interesting. I, a lot of people think that it's Wallace's best under the radar game but i highly disagree um it can be fun to bid against your friends and give input on where you think everybody should be building track but i would much much rather play another wallace or really anything um a lot of other games for that matter and i'm gonna rate it a two i do not really like this game at all all right no rating from this kid just because you know one play but i certainly want to play it again all right there you go You can play it with Tony. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. (laughs) And that's Steel Driver. All right, Tony. So a lot of people are excited about this game that's up on Kickstarter. And you decided because you wanted to be a team player and because you knew you were coming back onto the show, you wanted to spend way too much money and purchase, import a copy just so the listeners can get your input on what game is it? No, I'm (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> totally kidding. You just yeah. wanted to play the game. All right, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm an impulsive beast. Yokohama, Hisashi Hayashi's latest and greatest, and uh, that name should sound familiar to people because he's the designer of trains, 
which is the, a Dominion clone, Trick of the Rails, yes. Sail to India, Minerva, String Railway, Safari, Rolling Japan, all these, all these crazy games. And uh, Yokohama is, uh, I guess, his most complex work, frankly. And it's a one to two hour game, depending on the number of players. And the, it, it features two, three, or four players. The board scales in size to handle that. The copy I have is Hayashi's own Okazu brand from his own publishing house there in Japan. Because, yes, I am an impulsive guy. I sent away to Hobby Games Boardwalk in Japan. It's where we bought our 18xx games. And uh, Saito san's just a, a phenomenal guy, gives great service. And uh, so I said, hey, I sent him an email. You got any Yokohama? And he said, yeah. It's 5,500 yen and another 5,000 yen for shipping. So it was about 95 bucks total to get so it over So it was as much in shipping, essentially, as it essentially. was. Ouch. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, I, I didn't care. I didn't know anything about the, the Kickstarter coming or anything. And um, I might have waited, but then the Kickstarter's April. I'm like, ah, screw that. So I'm glad I have it. But um, what I really... Um, I got it for it was because I really thought it would be a more complex game that would uh, give me some enjoyment as well, but be uh, challenging enough for Robin too, that we could, uh, it would be something that we could play together and with friends as well. And uh, I have to say, after several plays, that assumption was correct. So um, the Kickstarter, Tasty Minstrels kickstarting this thing, Deluxe Edition, Wood, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I really think they're doing a really cool thing selling it for 60 bucks. They, they mentioned they're selling the wood at cost. And uh, I really figured it would be around 100 bucks on Kickstarter uh, once I heard it was about it coming on Kickstarter. So I think that looks good on them and that uh, backs up their mission statement about uh, the way they feel about games and people. So more power to them. I'm not going to back that Kickstarter, though, since I already own the game. But I also just like the cardboard counters in there over the shaped wood. It's nice. I mean, everybody likes cool bits, right? But yeah. I think it's unnecessary having played yours. The only thing I miss or will miss from the Kickstarter is those metal coins because you know how I am about that. But um, yeah, not not going to back the Kickstarter. Uh, I guess the artwork's a little bit cleaner too, but uh, frankly, only marginally so. So let's talk a little bit about the game, hey? Sure. People think that the game presents itself as this information overload, complicated thing, but it's really not. It, it just looks <laughs> helter skelter. Yeah. The, the gameplay is just really, really simple, actually. When I first saw it, my first thought was just like how Kanban can be really just visually overwhelming. But then once you learn it, you're like, oh, this is actually, no, this is simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, after a turn or two, you're you're in the game and you understand what's going on. Yeah. So don't don't be afraid, folks, to back the Kickstarter because of the way the game looks. I've heard it described as a better Istanbul, and I really feel that's faint praise because Istanbul's a piece of crap um, for my taste and for Robin's taste anyway. Eh. Same here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You yeah. know, it, it this interests me enough to play it again, whereas yeah. Inst it, yes, exactly. Istanbul did not. No, it right. did not. Um. The theme of the game of Yokohama is that you're a merchant in old Yokohama and you and your assistants are scrambling around trying to establish your trading network so that you can gain the goods you need to fulfill the orders of the foreign markets. And honestly, this game is a mishmash of components. It's route building, worker placement, resource collection, recipe fulfillment, a modular board, set collection, special powers, blah, blah, blah. And I just want to hit a little bit on each of those things. Obviously, the modular board stands out to everybody. and that, That's where the gameplay centers on, of course. And for the, when you're playing with two, three, or four, the board is uh, proportionately sized for that player count. And certain cards or certain pieces of the board are not in play at the different player counts. So, um, and, and they're laid out randomly. So all those things together really can produce some unique situations with the rest of the gameplay. Um, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of the way that manifests itself is in the route building because every turn you're placing zero to three assistants onto that uh, board and you have to you can place them in different locations or the same location. There's you know, certain rules about that. And then your pawn, your president, can only move along the locations that you have placed assistants. So that's that route that you have to build from market stall to market stall to market stall mm -hmm. if you want to get your president moving around and doing the actions that you need to get things moving in the game. And uh, 
I have suffered from not having a great route in the game, and I've seen great routes too. So the route building in the game is uh, it's strong. It's really there. It's also a worker placement game because my president can't go where your president is. Yeah, and that can be either intentional or mm-hmm. just fortuitous Yeah, uh, when you're the one that's blocking someone. Yeah, and there, it's a, there's a lighter element to it besides the blocking too because if I want to lay cubes where your president is or if I want to move my president through where your president is, I hey got to cough yeah. up some yen, baby. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> so I think, that's, uh, I think it's really cool. There's resource collection. Obviously, you're you're bopping around town trying to get copper and tea and silk and fish to meet the demands of the foreigners, and um, that's pretty cool because when you land on a place, let's say you're trying to you're going to go to the fish market to get some fish, it all matters how much fish you get matters to the amount of power that you have on the fish market. You get a point of power for your president. You get a point of power for each of your assistants that are already there. If you have a certain amount of power, you can build. Uh, shop houses and trading houses on that location so that that gives you persistent power for future plays Um, of course once you go there your assistants have to go away so your power is somewhat ablative so it's good to have those buildings for later and uh, however much power you have is is really the the strength and efficiency of your action on that spot so that's a really cool thing too because if you need something fast you're probably not going to have as much power built up as if you had been able to kind of nurse that along and build up a route and build up your power and then go bang it yeah, it's that whole, you know, uh, less for now or better for later type thing. Right. I think the recipe fulfillment is with the order cards, right? Like, hey, the Dutch merchant wants two silk, three fish, and a copper. Okay, great. And then when I fill, fulfill that, I'm going to get money, victory points, tokens, whatever, each of the cards. There's, I don't know how many order cards are in the game, but they're all different. And uh, there's a, a great deal of variability in both what's wanted and what your reward is for the fulfillment. And their special powers, they call them technologies. Uh, crazy rule breakers and bonuses, uh, extra points for doing this, extra money for doing that, or, oh, I can go where your president is, different technologies, different rule breakers, different special powers. So I read it described as point sandbox yeah. as opposed <laughs> to point salad in that you choose where you're getting your points from. I'll be honest, not only did I thought that was really, really pretty spot on, I'm going to steal the hell out of that. Did you see who said that? I didn't. It was Moosey Fate. Oh, oh yeah. no kidding. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, no. I, I, I played it with him. Yeah. Oh, he wrote nice. a big, long review after yeah. that play. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was actually really apropos in mm-hmm. that you choose where your points are coming from. So I think in, in previous reviews, I, I've actually said that. I've accused games of being point salady. I think I did that on Twa, but actually... Point sandbox makes a lot mm-hmm. more sense. When you're uh, collecting those orders, or, or when you're collecting those technologies and you're fulfilling those orders, you're also collecting little sets of um, national flags that are on those cards. And when you get a pair of those, you can get, um, it's called a, a foreign mercenary. So he's like a president kind of a thing that can go anywhere and do um, anything, as long as you have assistance there, of course. But even he's not even blocked by other players' presidents. So it's kind of important to get these pairs so that you can get these foreign mercenaries so that you can get a few extra actions in the game, too. Not only that, but they can be emergency actions yeah. as well. Be like, oh, no, I desperately need this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, collecting pairs of the flags gets you the, the mercenaries, but collecting different sets of the different flags get you points at the end of the game, so a little bit of a tug of war there. But all of these different mechanics that are mishmashed in here really creates these little tiny layers of interconnectedness. And and I really, really enjoy what it creates, actually. Yeah, it it felt like there wasn't a whole lot new to the game, mm-hmm. but the way the, the way the integration worked, it felt fresh and it felt interesting to me. Yeah, I, I really like the design. I think it's kind of low medium, you know, it's because it because there is some complexity and you got to think ahead and build your route. I don't it, it's definitely not loud light, excuse me, but it's definitely not heavy either. I no. think it's on the lower end of medium. The rules don't get in your way, etc. Yeah, and three felt like the sweet spot. I've only played it with three, but I don't know how I'd feel about two or four or either side. That might be two would probably be not enough interaction and four would just be crazy. Well, you're you're, you're spot on about three being the spe- sweet spot. I, th- I don't think you're quite spot on on the not enough interaction and the crazy because um, I've played it with all the counts and with two, it is a little uh, 
bland. Light. You know, there's yeah. not there's not as much blocking and stuff like mm-hmm. that. You know, but there's plenty of opportunity because it's a smaller board to. That's oh, true. I got to cough up yen all the freaking time to run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because you're always you're always intersecting each other. I yeah. would think, Right. And then with four, um, you know, all those presidents out there, uh, chances are uh, somebody's going to be blocking where you need to be and stuff. You know, some of the buildings have doubles when you're playing with four, but it still seems like sometimes the way the board gets laid out, it's just a traffic jam and it's... Uh, you have to have a, a, a plan B, possibly oh, a plan C, right? Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, definitely three is, I think, the sweet spot for this game. I, I personally, um, I don't know, I'm going to rate it a four probably. I mean, it's, uh, it's a fine game. It's not, from my taste, it's not a five. You know what I mean? It's certainly not okay. a Hall of Famer. But I mean, it's, it's the top of the fours for me. And uh, I, I have no problem recommending this game, whether you're going to wait for April or May or whenever they're really going to deliver that because they've really sold the hell out of it. Um, or you just order one from Japan. So I would say do it. As far as Amanda, well, you and I have only played yeah, it once. I don't feel comfortable giving it a rating at this point. All right. Let me ask you, do you want me to back it? Gosh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Of course. What so. did I just say? I said do it. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Because I'll be honest, um, the one thing I'm concerned about, the visually too busy, no. What, as soon as you taught us the game, the whole board made sense and it yeah. was it was really clear. There, yeah. There's no problem with that. What I wonder, though, is I wonder if the variability is the best appeal of the game. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's nothing too drastic that changes, but is there enough there to keep it fresh? And does it make me want to come back and play it game after game i don't know i mean i i'm 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 getting a bit of a stoffer dynasty feel to this <laughs> yeah, in that yeah. the variability was really cool but that in and of itself isn't enough to make it an interesting game now i'm not saying that i can definitively say one way or the other i'm just right. saying after one play that's what i'm I'm wondering, and so that's True. why I'm hesitating on whether or not to back it right now. I, I'm going to say this. The uh, the gameplay is interesting, and there are several different uh, pathways. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to fulfill orders, because there's, oh, totally. there's other things. I there's agree with you know, that. the church and the customs house, blah, blah, blah. But um, all the variability does, is, is because the variability is amazing, right? Where the cards, or excuse me, where the board is, all the different location tiles, how it gets laid out. Each of those gets a separate card. Each of those gets a separate a little bonus tile on it. The variability does not um, enhance the gameplay. It's not like this game's going to be different from this game that's going to be different from this game because of the variability. What the variability does in this game is actually, from game to game, even though the situations are the same and the strategies are the same and the pathways are the same, the actual topography of the of the of the game is different, and now even though I, I'm going to go down this path or this path, but that path is never the same as it was in in previous games mm-hmm. in terms of how I have to get there and how I have to manipulate the game. Let me ask you this then before before we close this down. And again, I'm not I'm not trying to poo poo or either way one game. It's just questions that I have that I'm not sure having only played it once is. How many games do you expect to get out of this? Uh, I don't know, a dozen. I'm probably okay. and I'm halfway there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So so you're still interested in playing it more after this half dozen plays. Yeah, and um, Robin mentioned the other day she got cuz you know, I'm always culling games off my shelf like, "Okay, this can go on the auction shelf." She's like, "This one doesn't go on the auction shelf." Okay. I, hopefully that helps answer questions because I'm sure I'm not the only one that has these same. And granted, I've played it once, but it's still, I don't feel like it's enough to really, yes, I support backing this or no, stay away. You know what I mean? And so I'm, I'm kind of leaning on you in that respect and hoping to help all our listeners out there. That's Yokohama. In Madarasha. You are cabbage. What? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Let's talk about St. Petersburg. Yeah, St. Petersburg. Originally published in 2004, republished as a second edition in 2014, designed by... Oh, wait. Hey, Tony. Yes, sir. Who who designed this? Well, uh, Michael Tumulhofer (laughs) was the... 
was the designer of the first edition. Hold on, is, that's not a real person. No, no, it's the one and only Bernd Brunhofer. But um, his pseudonym, Michael Tumelhofer, is a tribute to um, a couple of the people that are important to his life. An artist by the name of Michael Brunisma and the founder of Rio Grande Games, Jay Tumelson. So Michael Tumelhofer, and Hofer being part of Bernd's name, is Michael Tumelhofer is... Michael Brunisma, Jay Tumelson, and Bern Brunhofer all kind of conglommed together. I thought it was kind of cool. The guy pays tribute to his friends in his name. That's cool. So the artist, at least for the second edition, is Irene Bressel and Anne Patsky. But for the first edition, it is world-famous Doris Mathaus. Published by 157.2 publishers, <laughs> yeah. Rio Grande, Z-Man, Hansem Gluck, and a million others. It plays two to five players, plays 60 to 90 minutes, depending on what edition you're playing. As far as availability and cost, hey, it's in stock over at Game Surplus for 44 bucks. The second edition, if you're interested. This was out of print for a long, long time, but the second edition has since made it more widely available again. So what's going on in St. Petersburg? In St. Petersburg, players are building the city of St. Petersburg. To make this possible, players must balance their rubles to purchase cards. Greetings heavy cardboard, Edward and Amanda. As always, we are anonymous. We sincerely hope that you have heard about us. It has come to our attention that certain quality board games have not been covered by your podcast. We wish to give you an opportunity to correct this injustice. Consider, for a moment, a game like St. Petersburg. It is a classic game, long out of print until republished as a second edition in 2015, over a year ago. Shame on you heavy cardboard. Allow us to provide a small overview with which to make our point. We trust that your further research will confirm our information. Starting with a mere 25 rubles, the players embark upon round after round of buying the cards that are available on the game board in order to build a tableau, read engine, that should sustain them with income in both rubles and victory points. The game has four decks of said cards, five decks if playing with the marketplace expansion from the second edition. The decks correspond to a phase in each turn. In the worker round, players will purchase available worker cards from the game. For the most part, workers provide an income of rubles for the player. Some do provide the odd victory point of course. The cards are designed to be an investment as it takes 1 to 3 rounds before a card will cover its investment. In the building round, players will purchase available building cards. Buildings typically provide victory points but some do provide rubles and others provide special abilities. With some exception, buildings are typically more expensive to acquire than workers. Ah, but this is what creates tough decisions. In the market round, players will purchase market cards and increase their dominance in the five markets. This dominance, loved by Anonymous, provides a growing number of victory points in every round. It is also possible to make additional rubles in the marketplace. In the aristocrat round, players will purchase aristocrat cards. Ah, uh, aristocrats, how we at Anonymous love to expose them in their indiscretions. Varying in cost from cheap to quite costly, aristocrats provide some income in neither rubles, victory points or even both. In the upgrade round, players will purchase cards that replace existing cards by upgrading them. This provides enhanced incomes for the player. Sounds, simple, yes. It is. Ah, but it deliciously difficult to master. Anonymous approves. This is because St. Petersburg is one of the most effective engine builder games that has ever been designed. The proposition is quite simple, spend your money wisely building an income of cash and victory points. The economy of the game is perfect. Money is tight initially and continues to be tight for greedy souls that plan poorly and cannot restrain their spending. The truly greedy often fall victim to a trap designed into the game, the ability to take a card into your hand and pay for it later. Ah, the temptation, unless you divert future resources to the removal of this card from your hand you shall be penalized in victory points. 
Experiencing the frustration and the agony and yet thrilling joy of building your tableau is not expected to be foreign to your listeners, heavy cardboard. They deserve to be reminded of St. Petersburg's fantastic attributes. The second edition is beautiful. Arguably more beautiful than the divisive artwork of the first edition. If only they had included a card with the image of an aristocrat in a Guy Fox mask the superiority of this edition's artwork would be unquestioned. Anonymous shall address that directly with the artists involved. The second edition includes a fifth deck of cards that represents a marketplace. The use of this deck is optional, you may play using first edition rules. However, Anonymous has determined that there is no reason to exclude this deck from all plays of this masterpiece game work. Yes, it lengthens the game a little, but, heavy cardboard, your listeners profess not to fear the length of a game. The additional complications added by this deck far outweigh the additional cost in clock time. For example, the deck creates a competition between players for market dominance in five different goods, which provides a significant number of victory points and can serve to lessen the effect of the aristocrat rush. Ah, yes, the aristocrat rush. Anonymous has determined that this potential flaw in the game is the only thing that lowers the rating of this brilliant design. Often. The game comes down to who can collect the greater number of unique aristocrat cards. Such a poor use for such a grand engine. Luckily, as mentioned, the marketplace serves to rescue, in part, this portion of the game by retaining its importance but reducing its dominance. Something Anonymous is quite talented at as well. The second edition also includes several modular expansions that, by and large, are unfortunate and need not ever see the light of day. To demonstrate our magnanimity, Anonymous understands that the designer's desire to satisfy the good of the people has not delivered the expected results, we forgive the zealousness of the designer and publisher for this transgression. As you can see, this game and many others are certainly worthy of your immediate attention. On your scale, St. Petersburg easily rates as a 5. We demand that you examine your upcoming schedule and review additional classic games. If our demands are not met, you will hear from us. We have potentially reputation damaging information about your true gameplay habits. Let's keep those little munchkins our secret. Our people are monitoring your podcast. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Heavy cardboard, expect us. So let's start off, let's talk scalability. As far as plays, player counts, we've experienced in scalability. I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 plays of this uh, across all the player accounts, most with the original edition and three or four with the second edition. I have about eight, mostly the first edition, but I do have a couple in the second edition. I've played all player accounts. This is probably um, maybe my most played game ever. And between first edition and second edition, both I've played a lot. I, I have, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't count my plays. But I got to feel like it's at least 20 between the two editions and all player counts, of course. All right. As far as scalability, there just isn't a ton of scaling in the game as the amount of cards first dealt from the green deck differs between player counts. But that's not to say that the game doesn't play well across the range of player counts. I personally think it really plays great two to five. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, we played a two player game of it uh, a few days ago and it was really, really good. Um, the card display can kind of wax and wane in that some rounds will have only two or three cards from the previous round, but then another round will have like six or seven in the bottom row. So that's really the only difference, I guess, that I noticed with a smaller player count, but it didn't seem like a big deal at all. I see that in all player counts. The market fluctuates. Mm -hmm. just depends on you know how, uh, how people are doing. All right, let's move on to the cardboard then, the components and graphic design. Components first. Tony? So for the graphic design, <laughs> I have no problem with the components. It's uh, yeah. Graphics is what I want to talk about. Right. I, I, I think the components are fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, big chunky bits, especially in the second edition, the, the quality of the cards is fine. I don't feel the need to sleeve them because yeah. I feel like they're sturdy. Yeah, they're sturdy. The board's good. Oh, mine are sleeved, baby. Of course they are. I'm a sleeveaholic. Yes, yes. you are. All right, so since you guys are chomping it a bit to get the graphic design, go for it. The art in the second edition 
I much prefer than the first edition. Um, there are people on both sides of that camp, but I... That first edition, whoo, that's some hard art to get past. <clears throat> I The only thing that I don't really care too much for in the second edition is how real the people look. It's a little too photorealistic for it, my taste. It's like they photographed it, brushed it, and then 3D rendered yeah, it or something like that, Yes, right? yes. It freaks me out a little bit. An- Uncanny Valley type thing that I don't know about if I like or not. And I, well, no, I do know I don't like it. Um, but... I don't really also don't care for the people, the real people in the cards, Tom Vassell, Stefan Feld, the designer. I just, and speaking as a person that's in a game, I'm not famous. So if that wasn't a big deal for me, I can look past that. But, you know, I don't care if Kickstarter backers, whatever, those types of people are in cards. I think that's cool. But having famous people in the cards is just kind of strange to me. I think it's interesting that you prefer the second edition art, it, more contemporary. Um, I, I, I learned while getting ready for the show, the first edition, that type of artwork is called Persona. I, I was ignorant as to that. And I'll be honest, I like the second edition more in a sense that everything but the people mm-hmm. uh, for the same thing. Just I like the artwork in the, in the second edition except for the people so mm-hmm. if i could like mix and match that'd be perfect yeah well definitely the art's a sore point with uh almost everybody when they when they're talking about this game and um frankly the the new art i just feel like it lacks any real distinction the old art was divisive and i i think doris matas nailed it on the head because that's what good art's supposed to do man it's supposed to make you feel something whether right. it's revulsion or yep. love or somewhere in between and, uh, and the new art just kind of makes me feel uh, ill. Uh, I loved <laughs> the old art. And um, I, the, the new art's like, it's like Prozac. It's just, nah, I don't know what I'm looking at. I, uh, like you guys, I am not a fan of seeing uh, the designers and one reviewer in, on the cards. I, I think it's weird. I don't hate it. I don't like it. Um, I, I, $5 says that uh, Bernd Brunhofer did it out of respect. I mean, hell, is his name, his pen name, is a sign of respect. So I'm right. sure that he, he put those people in out of respect. But, yeah, like they probably should have just been thanked in the rule book or something because, mm-hmm. yeah. That, yeah, that's no good. So as far as graphic design itself, other than the artwork, yeah. any, any qualms one way or one, the other? Just one. Um, the little box around the number. That could be that, darker. Yes. yes. Like it's so hard in the second edition to mm-hmm. see that box. And some people are like, oh, crap, that's an upgrade. I didn't, yeah. you know, you, you can miss it. Yep. Very easily. But other than that, I have no problems with it. I have a little tiny one. Um, just if there was some way, uh, and as you play this game more and more, and I'm sure a lot of the, our listeners have played this game plenty of times, but for those that don't, just the way the end of the round works and how many cards you actually deal out. And if there could be some sort of graphical implementation of that on the board as to what happens at the end of the round, yeah, it would have been nice, but it's not a big deal. Second edition gives you some of that. It tells you at the end of the round, you're going to score card or money or victory points or both. Sure. Or- no, at the end of each of the individual card phases. But I'm talking at the end of the round. Hey, you move these cards, you get rid of these cards. You only deal out where they're, you know, to where it's a max of 12 cards, etc. That type of thing. That's all. So we are notorious for hating paper money, but the second edition paper money is so awesome and completely usable right out of the box. It's not paper it's like some kind of like really high quality i don't know it's not it's not as thick as cards but it's really really good and uh you can't keep poker chips secret and secret money is important in this game um so if you're a lemming and always think paper money sucks and poker poker chips rules you would be incorrect in thinking that in this game in the first edition i used my paper money then too i actually laminated my paper money in the first edition so of course you did when i sold my first edition i hope whoever the hell bought that appreciated that uh using secret money can't be done with poker chips and it's mandatory in this game one correction that can be done with poker chips Mm -hmm. we have victory point chips that are blank on one side so you can do it and we use that those are not poker chips then 
Uh, fair point. <laughs> Ceramic pieces of yeah yeah you do, right not not poker chips but if you have you know like Meeple Source makes some chips that are just money sure. on one side yeah, and yeah. all the same color and size and everything I'm gonna you just need to you something like that you know as far as the the paper money ours hasn't been touched um, one thing I do want to highlight is the insert which normally let's face it everybody on this show hates inserts yep. across the board as far as standard you know, whatever normally comes in the game. Obviously, we're all big fans of Meeple Realty, et cetera, et cetera. But the insert that's in this is actually functional. You don't have to bag all the, uh, in the second edition, you don't have to bag all the cards. They stay there because of the way the board sits and we store all our games vertically and it stays organized. So that was, I was pleasantly surprised that about nice that. nice to see that. Mine went in the trash 30 seconds after opening it. <laughs> there we go. All right. Maybe I should have took a second look at that. All right. So the rule book, clarity and quality. I thought it was easy to read, easy to follow. Every question that we had was easy enough to find in a rule book. Tony, you have any issues with it? Uh, no. Sometimes uh, I, I have a hard time finding how many cards to start with or whatever. But for some reason, I can't get that into my head, even though I've played it a million times. But other than that, I really just don't look at the rule book anymore. So, fair point. Yeah, we had to um, for the uh, for the differences on on player count. Mm-hmm. You know what to do in a two player game, etc. And it was easy enough to find. So no qualms. So uh, heavy or medium? I would say light medium. Yeah, same here. What do you think? Uh, I'm just gonna say straight up medium. Okay. Well, let's get into that. So start with the complexity. Go for it. Well, rules complexity, uh, there is none. Uh, but what about the planning, the forethought, the thinking ahead, the organizing activities to achieve a goal? What do you think about that? I don't think it requires a ton of planning. Basically, the only thing that you really need to plan on is making sure you don't completely run out of money. Um, <laughs> you have to have a good engine going before you can you know, really buy the really expensive cards. But um, other than that, I don't really think there's a ton of stuff going on here i don't think it's an exercise in planning like you said i think it's an exercise in prudence yeah and we actually we ran into that problem because we uh, (laughs) we recently we played the two-player game and we were spending money like it was water you know like it would never run out and all of a sudden the game the, the game hit the brakes on both of us and there was an entire round where almost nothing got bought because we were ill-advised we we did a poor job of budgeting i do feel that the game is highly tactical based on what cards come out however there is some planning based on anticipating going first or earlier in in turn order depending on what you know uh, based on the deck that's coming up so i think that there can be some planning as far as uh how to budget maybe would be a good way to put it Oh, yeah, you cannot act too rashly. Oh, look at that card. No. Yeah, Stay on target. Stay on target. If you really, really want it, put it in your hand. So it's a card game. What do you think about luck and random factors? I really think the only luck and random factors is honestly just how the cards come out and what cards come out. There isn't any, there's no die rolling. There's nothing like that. No. I think, you know, sometimes you can get lucky like, oh, I'm first in this phase. Oh, look what building just came out. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Like I, I specifically highlighted, oh, wow. The observatory and yes. I'm first. Okay, King. awesome. But other than that, it, it you know, other than some players lucking out by the right card coming at the right time, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever. It, you still have to have space in your hand or the money available to buy it. So yeah. <laughs> right. And that space in your hand can be a bit of a poison pill. But more on that oh. later. <laughs> Robin just handed me a note. The game is medium. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And <laughs> has she ever lost? Oh yeah, I, I, I've I have beaten her at St. Petersburg. Um, I was once. a younger man then. Once I heard it. <laughs> yeah, she or she just said once. Uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure I've beat her. Uh, I just can't remember any instances. All right. So the last one then, the getting it. I think we're all going to be pretty, uh, pretty of the same mind as far as I'd say. After the first round, you're gonna. Mm-hmm everyone's going to understand how the game plays. It d- help seeing how the aristocrat score at the end helps to fully understand how that works, but it's not like that's a gigantic hurdle that's insanely difficult to understand anyway. And it is right there written on the board. Yes. 
It's, <laughs> but it's 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 important to make sure that you are looking around at all the other players to see how many aristocrats they are gathering when the game's getting close to ending because you want to make sure that you get more than them. Yeah, it's definitely something that uh, before the second edition, and as we talk about the game some more, I'll go into why, but like when I was teaching the first edition, I, I just felt like I always had to make sure I told new players two things. One, money's tight, and two, buy aristocrats. And I felt like I'd have to say that at least that last part, four or five times during the game, well, or, or during the instruction of the game. Yeah. Agreed, because the first edition essentially is an engine builder to get aristocrats. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, man. really the crux of the game. Yeah, yeah. All right, so what makes the game enjoyable? The market in the second edition adds so much more to the game. And as we were just saying, the original game, you had to focus so much on aristocrats, and if you didn't, you had zero chance of winning, especially against Robin. Um but just, I enjoy it with the, the market a lot more. It doesn't add, it doesn't completely negate aristocrats, but it helps to get you points in other ways. It gives you other avenues, yeah. I feel like, yeah. other paths. Absolutely. You can get a lot of points from hitting the market hard. And uh, I think it's very important. And, and like Amanda said, it doesn't diminish from the um, collection of the aristocrats because that's still really, really important. Um, but uh, you can you can really make a big difference in the game with your play in the market phase. And I have no reason ever, never, never, ever, ever, never to play the game without the market deck. Mm-hmm. And I know that's a big point of contention with some people, mm-hmm. but I'll be honest, I'll support that. I-, I feel the same way. Yeah. But for those that don't feel that way, you can play the original game. Flip the board over without the market. You can take out all the hundreds of uh, modules. Okay, there's seven, six, seven. (laughs) Um, And and you can play the base game. So I think the the fact that they kept that integrity of the first edition uh, available, minus the artwork, nothing you can do about that. Right, Um, right. But kudos to them for making that available in the second edition. Hey, you play whatever game you want to play. So you just added um, a, a fifth deck, right? So that's 25% more deck. And uh, so that adds length to the game, but you know, hell, we don't, we don't care about game length as long as the game remains interesting. Exactly. Yep. And honestly, I, I really do want to drive home that, that fact that the market only makes the game more interesting. Mm-hmm. Some people would argue that the game, it loses its purity in that it's it's simpleness, not simpleness, that's the wrong word, but it's singular design goal with the second edition, with the market, but I think it only adds breadth as well as depth to the game and improves upon it. I feel that the engine building and the economy in this game is extremely well designed and, and very, very tight. I, I think it's one of the finest set designs um, in board gaming, frankly, um, I think I, I play pretty well, but I'm I'm always fighting for income. It seems, and um, austerity just stalks me at every corner. And the prudence of my decision making is always being challenged by this game, and uh, I I just uh, enjoy that to no end. Yeah, I, and going back to the market for a second, I market play is enjoyable to me. I like the push and pull of making sure I'm ahead of my opponent in fish or. Or whatever, yeah. Because like the whenever Edward and I played the other day, the first market round, I made sure to get the fish because that was the only fish on the board. So I wanted to make sure to get that so that I would at least be higher than him on <laughs> one of those tracks. Yeah, and get and, those and, points. And those cards, like the you know the not just in the market deck, but some of the cards in the other decks have the little market mm-hmm. symbols too. So like, that's a really great place to pick up that one fish and stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe this card isn't the best card available, but it helps me in other ways. Exactly. So it makes up for it. And then maybe I get to save a few bucks by not getting this other one. And I make up the point difference because of the market, et cetera, et cetera, because ties go to... You know, you don't share. You just, you each get whatever the the higher number is on the market. It's a win-win, you know, and it gives you, again, it just gives you more options at your disposal. 
But you see that that one little twist of, okay, here's this blue card with a fish symbol on it. I don't need to spend eight bucks on that, but damn it, I'm going to get another fish. Mm-hmm. That, that's challenging me. That you know, Austerity, that, that's, what, that's why austerity stalks me, because I'm like, oh, squirrel. <laughs> or in this case, oh, fish. Um, I like being able to hold cards for purchase later. And I also like that if you don't get them out of your hand, then there are in-game penalties. And there should be, you know, don't let your eyes get bigger than your wallet. So and I like I like that you can maybe play them, you know, get them, get them at least from another player that you definitely don't want to have it, but you don't have to immediately have the money to, to play it. Do you like the warehouse card that lets you keep four? I do. I've never yeah. had it, but I oh, like yeah. it. Oh, it's yeah. It's very... But, but it's very much a poison pill. Oh, yeah. That because your hand size is so limited, you can't be, ooh, squirrel, mm-hmm. you know, in every single card that you want because you're going to end up, there's always going to be another card that you desperately want or need. But now all of a sudden, if you were irresponsible and you were, ooh, shiny, you know, I, every card that was available to you, all of a sudden, now you have to pass on that really important aristocrat or upgrade card that you would have been able to hold into your hand. Oh, I'm two bucks short. Okay, I can just grab that and hold on to it for a short amount of time, whatever. I love that the game forces you into these really agonizing decisions of, man, I like that, but I already have two cards in my hand. How much do I like that? Do I like it or do I like it? (laughs) See, what you're saying, I think, is further evidence of just the brilliance of the engine here. And why is there so many shiny things? Because every deck is important, man. The green deck. You got to build your income, right? Got to so get sp- that engine going. Got to spend yes. money to make money. The blue deck. At some point, you're going to need to hit some VP coming out of there. So I got to spend more money to get these buildings. And usually the buildings aren't going to put money back in my pocket, right? That's that's an investment in victory. And then the yellow, the the market, it's you know a, a huge source of victory points, the new aspect of the game that we've been talking about. And like you guys said, I don't think it's seamless, but I, I do think it's... Um, very welcomed and exceedingly important. The, the, the aristocrats, um, obviously, it's always a dogfight for those VPs. And uh, luckily, a lot of those guys give you a little uh, trickle of cash, too. So that's not uh, the end of the world. But there's, there's, but you're trying to get different ones, so you're trying to put those shiny guys in your hand or, or build them outright. And then, of course, the upgrade deck is always critical to changing your cards to make uh, more VP or more money or a little of both. And, uh, and especially helpful getting more unique aristocrats. So, all right, I'm going to get two warehouse managers so I can like upgrade one into the mistress of ceremonies or something, you know, or whatever. It's funny you bring that up because I actually, I invested in three warehouse managers um, because anticipating the upgrades. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 I but that's another bag. squirrel, because <laughs> like if you, you, how many did you get stuck with at the end of the game? Three, because okay. I wasn't able to upgrade <laughs> okay. them. Yeah, just the upgrades yeah. just didn't play out. And there's that randomness, but based on the weight of the game, based on the game length and all those other things, I don't mind it in this case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I knew when I took these multiple warehouse managers, I knew the risk I was taking that there was a chance that I just wasn't going to get the upgrades. Well, I ended up wasting essentially 20 bucks in those two extra warehouse managers that I wasn't able to upgrade. But you live and learn. And it's it was a risk that I made with my eyes open. Right. I probably only bought two. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Main, my- mainly because I wouldn't be able to afford three. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, one more thing, I think, uh, from me, besides, besides the game's just super challenging and easy to teach in a, in a good, good ratio to that of those things. But, um, more, more of the brilliance of the engine, I think. And that is like a good market, the cards in that market. And that is a market. And the market has an ebb and flow through the rounds at first. Hey, I start the game with 25 rubles. Everybody's buying up every card in sight, you know, and, yep. you know, and like, so, all right, cool. We're going to lay out seven more cards. It's in the blue round. And then as as we get into the game and reality sets in and uh, austerity hits because we haven't been being prudent, 
um, okay, let's go to the upgrade round. You turn over like one card. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh my God. You know, the, the market just stalls at times and then it picks back up and then all the cards go down to the bottom and they go away. And it's just the, the way the market ebbs and flows and, um, and because of the way players are playing, but then it has that mechanism where the market can get flushed if, if but players aren't buying them. Um, just freaking genius, man. Last thing I got here. Uh, to go back to that market aspect is I like that the carts full, every every good has one cart full or a bushel, whatever they want to call them, to where there's four of whatever it is, say four fish, four wheat, whatever. And it's only a dollar. That's awesome. Fantastic. However, every round before you score the market, you have to pay a tax, and that tax is the highest number of whatever the scoring will be, but in money. So in the first round, you know, it's only a buck. All right, cool, good. Second round, it's two bucks, then three, then four, then five, then six to be able to keep it. If not, you, you're forced to discard it. So it gives you this huge head start, you know, with this four of a good. But the problem is that that permanent, or as long as you want to keep it permanent, upgrade cost or or almost like rent that you're having to pay <laughs> and it really it just adds another really tough decision for those that get those cards do i do i keep this big lead that i have or is maybe this will drop me to second place because i have to go back for if i discard it but then there's these you know maybe somebody has one of the special rule breaker cards that allows them to fish through the discard pile and now you're giving that advantage to them so do you do you keep it away from them because of that just more decisions is always a good thing and that's what the market brings and that's what even those one little bushel cards of each good bring to the table i'm a huge fan of that so what are you uh what are you not a huge fan of anything yeah all right how about this the expansions that come in the second edition. So the New Society and the Banquet expansions, those are older expansions. And by and large, those are, are solid. There's a couple of cards I don't care for that I don't put in the game that because they're just too wacko. But they're modular at least. But they're modular, right. But all those other expansions in the second edition are just this hugely tragic error that the designer and or the publisher created. It's just terrible, useless, worthless. Like I think... I think those expansions, those modular expansions, only exist because of crowdfunding. Uh, modular abominations. Yeah, I agree. They, they exist simply because they, the, the need, the, the current, oh, we have to have stretch goals yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. it is. You don't have stretch goals. You're not cool. Right. And that's exactly what they are. I'll be honest. Outside of the banquet in New Society, those are the only ones we've ever played with. I have no interest in playing the others. Yeah, Zero. I, Zero. I've tried them I've, all and once and said no to all but New Society and Banquet. Those are the good ones. But on the positive side, get in where you fit in, right? Play what yeah. you dig. If you yeah. and your group want to play with them, they're there for you. And if, not, and if not, no harm, no foul, right? You know, Absolutely. a primary reason for me not to like them is they do... Uh, make the game easier for players, and uh, one of them puts like a scoring throttle on. So you know they might have their purposes with some groups, but you know that that's what makes them uh, such a uh, disaster for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. Outside of that, yeah. I mean, we already touched on the artwork. Take it or leave yeah. it. First, well, second edition, whatever. The observatory card. I, I love it, but I often feel. Like, I, I hate saying, oh, this is too powerful. This game is broke. You know, like, boy, that observatory card is like one of the two instances in board gaming that make me think, hmm, maybe that card's a little much. I will say this, and I, I agree with you in a sense that I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the designer, the playtesters, etc. But in our group, in our play group, whoever is first when that card comes out, it gets snatched up, be it if you don't have the money, it goes into your hand. And if you do have the money, it is instantly bought. There are two. And uh, in one of those expansions, New Society or Banquet, I, I don't know, it's been too long. They actually reissued that card with a higher price and still not high enough, if you ask me. 
Oh, wow. So, so even though, yeah, I like you, I trust in the play testers and everything, but uh, because they reissued it, they did get it wrong the first time and uh, possibly the second. If you have an AP person in the group, um, buy an egg timer because sometimes I see people like, uh, what am I going to do? What really? Am I gonna I, buy? I've yet yeah. to encounter that. Really? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the, the game doesn't warrant it. <laughs> you know? No, it really doesn't. And that's why it surprises me. Yeah. But at the same time, this goes back to earlier when we were talking Yokohama. There, there were instances that on a game that simple, I still tanked way more than I thought I should. <laughs> I'm like, what was your first uh, time? So, so we, I guess it could happen in just about any game, but... Did I mention the expansions were bad? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. No, that's all I've got there. Amanda, we'll let you go first since you hate following me and I hate following Tony. Perfect. On our summaries. So my that's last? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But first in your hearts. Yeah, always. Totally. <laughs> the world of St. Petersburg is vast, from hiring a lumberjack to hanging with aristocrats. The board, the artwork, everything comes together to make a supremely awesome game. I very much enjoy St. Petersburg, and I'm almost always up for a game of it. Especially even having played it at two players now, it is a game that should see the table often. Mine's pretty simple. If you haven't done yourself the favor of trying out St. Petersburg, rectify that as soon as possible. If you have played it, you know exactly what we're talking about. It's a classic for a reason, and there is not a single person in our entire game group that does not truly love this game. Absolute Hall of Fame game to me. The engine building aspect of St. Petersburg is, I'm going to get crazy here, one of the best ever designed in board gaming, for Euros at least. It's tight, it makes you budget, it rewards you, it punishes you, and here's what I think most importantly, it tempts you. And I really, really like that. I think that temptation is critical. Like, the cards actually, I can hear them in my head along with the other voices. Hey, you can afford me. Hey, there's room in your hand for me. And this is where the game makes me consider it an exercise in prudence. That temptation is just uh, too often overwhelming for me. Um, and after all these years, the game doesn't get multiple repeated plays. Like, we're not going to play St. Petersburg uh, two times next month. But what the game does get is steady play. We break it out on a pretty consistent basis. And Totally agree. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that says a lot. Every couple months, this, this game comes off the shelf, man. It's got staying power. I I don't give a crap about the cult of the new or cult of the old. This game's cult of the classic. That's what I say. And uh, it's always a pleasure for me to revisit this game. So if you're just listening to the show for the first time, we rate on a one to six scale. One, it's not me. It's you. Burn it with fire and damn you if you were to pass this game on to anyone else. A two, it's not you. It's me. Just not our cup of tea. Accept it and move on. Three, we feel the game, it's a little below average, but there may be some redeeming features and mechanics, but overall just meh. Now a four, now we're talking above average. Mechanically or in gameplay, there's something good going on, and this is the point at which we consider owning a copy. A five is terrific, dare I say great game. Strongly like the game and almost assuredly will own it. And a six... Now you're talking a Hall of Fame game potential for us. No brainer. We will absolutely 100% own this game. All right. I, I don't think this is going to be a big reach here or a big shock to anybody, but uh, ratings, guys, what do you all got? Swing back around the, the reverse way. Sure, I'll go first. Amanda will go last. Okay. First edition, um, a five probably. I, I really, really like it. Second edition, a six. The marketplace just uh, makes it a much, much better game for me. Definitely... Classic status. Hall of Famer, baby. I would take this game to a desert island. I completely agree with you with the one ca caveat that the second edition, while I rated a six, eh, on the artwork. But again, artwork, schmirk, work. Eh, That's right. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Give me a great game, which is what this is, and I'm happy as a pig in... Well, I'm happy. Let's just put it that <laughs> So yeah, I give it a five for the first edition and the addition of the market in the second edition. The... Extra modules notwithstanding, I rated a six. A six. There's no doubt. This game is amazing. Unanimous. I think that's the first time we've ever rated something unanimous across the three of us. That's quite that's likely. Cool. Rock on. Right on. All right. And that's St. Petersburg. Petersburg. 
We want to thank the great folks over at GameStar Plus for their sponsorship of the show. When you put together great people with a great reputation with a great inventory of games, which includes many imports and hard-to-find games, you have a winning combination. Their tagline is home of great games at great prices, so check them out at GameStarPlus.com. If you're looking for an import game, or really any game that may or may not be widely available, don't hesitate to contact Velma at games at GameStarPlus.com and she'll work her magic for you. And when you do, make sure to tell them that Heavy Cardboard sent you. All right, so Edward, why don't you tell everybody how to get in contact with us? Our website, heavycardboard.com. Our email, contact at heavycardboard.com. We love hearing from our listeners, so don't be shy. Twitter, at Heavy Cardboard. We are very, very active on Twitter. Amanda's Twitter is at Amanda U. Facebook, Heavy Cardboard. Instagram, Heavy Cardboard. Our Patreon, come support us. We definitely appreciate everyone that is doing so. Patreon.com forward slash heavy cardboard. And our BGG guild is number 2044. A lot of good discussions pretty much continuously going on over there. So come join the guild and say hi. All right. Well, I kind of want this to go longer because I'm really enjoying uh, Tony staying on here. Hey, thanks, Uh, buddy. It's good to have you back, man. It's like old times. Thank you. Good stuff. Uh, It's been a fun evening with friends. A- absence makes the heart grow fonder, but screw that. Come back onto the show yeah. at least next quarter, right? <laughs> You'll have to boost your Patreon rent values. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so, hey, before we get out of here real quick, we wanted to wish a happy birthday to our buddy Aaron Thompson. Hope you enjoyed the loot that Stephanie got you. So have a great birthday. And Tony, we'll catch you next quarter. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. I, I look forward to whatever we're going to talk about. I, I'm excited because I have no idea. <laughs> no <laughs> right clue. On. The unknown is exciting. And as far as you and I, Amanda. Yeah. Um, Fields of Arla sound good next Sounds episode? Good. Let's do Ooh, it. I got to get mine back from Matt so I can play. All right. Game <laughs> on. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Cool. We'll catch you all. Uh, well, actually, in a week and a half since yeah. we're releasing this a little bit early. So... We'll catch you all then. Until then, stay cool out there and uh, talk soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Be free.